Thank you, Josh. Uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We hope all is well with you in these times. Welcome to the first of several happy hour programs sponsored by the English Speaking Union of the United States in celebration of its centennial, centennial year of 2020. As Josh said, I'm David Grissett. I'm president of the New Orleans branch of the English Speaking Union, and I'm honored to be introducing our speaker, Professor Robin B. Williams, not to be confused with the late comedian, who is, who is chairman of the architectural history department that he founded in 1995 at the Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD, as it is also known. Originally a native of Toronto, Canada, Professor Williams earned his doctorate in art history from the University of Pennsylvania, is the author of a book entitled Buildings of Savannah, and directed the online virtual historic Savannah project. SCAD has recently been ranked as the best college or university in the Southeast for art and commercial art instruction by Art and Object Magazine. And if you ever visit Savannah, you'll also see how many historic buildings the college has renovated and repurposed for its campus buildings. The topic we asked Professor Williams to speak to us about is Regency and Gothic Revival Architecture in the United States. Or for our friends viewing from the United Kingdom, and I think there are several, perhaps we should say Brighton and the Houses of Parliament revisited in the USA. Many of us are familiar with the popular Greek Revival and federal architectural styles of the early 19th century that appeared as plantation homes and formal townhouses in the South and in the East Coast cities. However, while visiting my daughter who graduated from SCAD several years ago, I became fascinated by the unique and intriguing period Regency and Gothic revival houses of Savannah, which are now museums that are somewhat less well known, but are certainly equally grand and interesting. Fast forward to last year while planning programs for our branch for spring 2020, we contacted Professor Williams, who agreed to come to New Orleans and present his program on this topic on March 19. Then, as we know, COVID-19 took over the United States that month, so his live presentation here was necessarily canceled. However, as our headquarters office in New York and its National Planning Committee formulated this happy hour series, to provide live virtual programs, we recontacted Professor Williams, who graciously agreed to be our lead off speaker today. We understand that he was also a speaker at our sister branch in Savannah a couple of years ago, so I'm sure that group is among our attendees today also. Since this is a happy hour program, we hope you have your favorite libation close at hand. You received a topic appropriate cocktail recipe video in your invitation called Chatham Artillery Punch, which actually originated in Savannah in the early 19th century of which we are talking today. For those not familiar, it might be described as a Southern version of Long Island iced tea, but it is more historic and has more punch. The recipe of it featured today is more or less the cocktail version. If you Google its history and use, you'll find a bit more complex recipe of it for big events, which marinates in an eight gallon pickling crock for the better part of a week and uses a case of champagne upon serving. I first enjoyed it at a party in Atlanta. Years later, I served it for a party in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I can tell you my guests drank the whole thing. Luckily, they were within walking distance of their homes. So per the video, I've made my lemon peel syrup two days ahead, have combined it with the equal parts of tea, gin, rum, cognac, and rye whiskey two hours ago or more, poured it over a glass of cracked ice just now, stirred and topped with champagne and a lemon peel. So. Here's cheers, and thanks to all joining us today, and Professor Williams, take it away. Thank you so much, David. It is such an honor to be the inaugural 
uh, speaker in your uh, happy hour series. I'll just have everyone know this is just water for now. I'll be uh, enjoying my celebratory libation after the talk. Um, and uh, honestly, it was uh, quite an interesting invitation because uh, Savannah is a city that is renowned for its urban plan and people come to Savannah and visit and they love the trees and the old buildings. But in the history of American architecture, Savannah and other southern buildings don't get quite the amount of attention I think they're due. And so this PowerPoint today is, um, and this presentation today is an effort to shed some light on, an early, on a phase of American architecture. And in fact, let me go to my screen and share it to you. And we'll, and I trust you can all see that now. So here's my title slide. And I, as I said, and as David mentioned, uh, the topic of today's uh, presentation is Regency and Gothic Revival, Architecture of the South. And these are stylistic categories, and I'm going to throw in a few extra goodies along the way that are bracketed by these two stylistic phases. And uh, so I want to unpack this title, though, because uh, this is the title that was actually given to me by the uh, English Speaking Union. And um, so here we go. So what is the Regency? Well, the Regency is a phase of uh, English history that relates to uh, the gentleman you see on the left. And of course, the Gothic revival we associate with churches and especially the works starting around the mid 19th century in England and spread to America and other countries. So the gentleman on the left is George IV, who the son of George IV, George III, who, as you may know, was one of England's longest serving monarchs and at the end of his reign suffered from porphyria, something portrayed in the movie, The Madness of King George. Unfortunately for George IV, his father was incapable of ruling but didn't die. So he could not become king until his father's death. So by the point he was old enough to be a, a surrogate king, what they call the Prince Regent in 1811, and by the time he assumed the throne in 1820 is a period we call the English Regency. Uh, so it's, it's a period that is very important in English history, as I'll explain in a moment. The picture on the right is a print from, an engraving from a publication by one of the leading Gothic revivalists, one of the advocates of the Gothic revival, and especially a, a more authentic and archeologically correct version of that revival, uh, A.W.M. Pugin, as you can see from the 1840s. So the period of the Regency was transformative for Britain. It was the period of the Napoleonic Wars when uh, Wellington, whom you see here on his horse, uh, at the decisive Battle of Waterloo, where he would be mortally wounded, ultimately defeats Napoleon and situates Britain at the, at the high point of imperial powers among European powers. It was, it was soon to become the most powerful imperial power uh, in the world with colonies across the world from Canada to India, Australia, South Africa, Northern South America. So as they would eventually say during the Victorian era, the sun never set on the British Empire because they had colonies all around the world. So it was a period of imperial expansion, tremendous prosperity, and of course the military success. It was also a period where the 18th century groundwork, the foundations of the Industrial Revolution were beginning to bear fruit with the beginning, early steps of the beginning of factories at the very end of the 18th century. By the early 19th century, industrial production in England was really ramping up. The achievements of England's engineers, such as um, uh, the, as you see on the right with the Clifton Sus Suspension Bridge designed in 1820, was one of the great landmarks of suspension bridge technology using uh, new cast and wrought iron technology. But it was also a period marked by stylistic exploration, experimentation, and adventure 
given the the confidence with which the British were enjoying the growth of their empire, the growth of their economy, and among other uh, signs of uh, material wealth, we can see evidence reflected in the architecture of this period of the 18 teens. For example, the prince himself commissioned the, the renovation of the Royal Pavilion at Brighton in the upper left, the greatest landmark in what we refer to as the Indian revival or Mughal revival uh, that was particularly interesting for the English. And this was essentially an, a formerly a, a neoclassical pavilion at the seaside for the royal family to, to enjoy. And he had it dressed up in this extravagant uh, style that you see here. It was also a period of the early days of the Gothic revival, but with the use of cast iron. So both of the buildings on the left are actually iron buildings, at least in part. The dome, in, the onion dome in the Royal Pavilion was not possible to situate on top of a pre-existing masonry building were it not for relatively lightweight and really strong cast iron. And the interior of the church you see on the bottom is so delicate and lightweight using likewise cast iron. On the right, we see one of the great architects of the day experimenting with new abstract forms. This is the architect we'll be hearing about, John Sohn, and his designs for the first purpose-built art gallery in the world that had skylighting. What is now the norm in art museums around the world was at the Dulwich Art Museum near London around 1820 landmark, but it's also super simple. It is really abstract and it's a quality of Regency architecture that we'll be talking about. It was also a period that the Prince embarked on landmark urban planning, Regent Street and Regent Park, named after his Regency, uh, that involved long rows of buildings, likewise simple, orderly, and that embraced green space from the English country gardens were brought into the city. So these were important variables or important characteristics of this period. And we can see echoes and influence of the early 19th century English ideals resonating in Southern cities. And we, in, particularly in Savannah, Charleston and New Orleans. And so today's talk is going to look at both the English um, precedents and the resonance and echoes in the American South. So it, one of the things that's important to understand here is how does this architecture compare to sort of the mainstream account of American architecture? And you might wonder also, why would Americans who have, who having fought so strenuously in the late 18th century in the American Revolution to rid themselves of British rule, to free themselves of King George, who was identified in the Declaration of Indefe Independence in 1776. This was a, a war that dragged on for about eight years. And 30 years later, they were back at it. The British and the Americans were fighting another war. This one lasted for about three years and was fought mainly around the Great Lakes Basin, the area around Washington and down in New Orleans. And it was the battle at, at um, the British attack that you see in this contemporary print, uh, the British attack on Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. And those are the rocket's red glare that you see in the print that gave rise to the American national anthem. And that is the flag that was flying, that was still there in the morning that uh, um, Francis Scott Key wrote about in the anthem. So that's the actual flag. And you can see some people there for scale. This is an enormous flag that was flying over the fort. You see it in the print. And, and so this was a war that was central to American uh, nationalism and American identity. And it was again fought against the British. So I've long wondered what's with the Americans having grown up in Canada and having learned a, a very different history of the War of 1812 from the Canadian perspective, it makes you wonder why were the Americans who were so eager to fight the British in these two wars willing to um, embrace British influence? Well, in fact, there's evidence that they wanted to re 
to break free of British influence, at least in name, in, in terms of the nomenclature that they used on their buildings. For example, the Georgian tradition of architecture was renamed the federal style, or sometimes it was called the Adam style after the British architect Robert Adam, but mo mostly it's called the federal style and it's characterized by red brick, classical um, red brick buildings with fairly simple exterior uh, ornamentation and rectangular windows with smaller divided lights, occasional round arched windows, but relatively limited in terms of porticos and statuary and things of that nature. So you can see uh, both a public building and a row of residential houses on the left, which are very, very typical of the federal style. And as David mentioned, the Greek revival style should be familiar to you. And it was wildly popular in the United States. Up north, it was popular for patriotic reasons because the Greeks invented democracy. And through the power of association, the Greek revival was a style that was used for public buildings like the Federal Hall in New York City from the 1840s on Wall Street. Or an earlier example, William Strickland's Second Bank of the United States in downtown Philadelphia. Both of these examples modeled after the Parthenon in Athens. But what about the South? Why look at this topic of Regency and Gothic revival in the South? And, you know, in preparing for this talk, I really reflected hard on this. And one of the fun things about being invited to do a presentation is that sometimes it challenges you to look at things from a different perspective. And that's what this topic has done for me. So when we think of the Southern cities of Savannah, Charleston and New Orleans, that we think of New Orleans, for example, especially with its French influence and Charleston with a kind of Caribbean influence and Savannah had a strong, um, well, of the three, Savannah is probably the most British city, but even so, all three we will see have evidence of Regency and other influences from the early 19th century that come straight from England. So part of what I'd like to suggest today is that the Southern states, because of the cotton trade, had a much greater investment in a connection with Britain. And in fact, by the way, Southern cities were not as sort of far down the list um, population-wise as they are today. In fact, five of the 15 largest cities in the United States in 1820 were southern cities, and you can see them highlighted here. So the three we've been talking about, as well as Richmond and Norfolk. So these were prominent cities within the America, within the United States, and the invention of the cotton gin outside of Savannah in 1793 played a decisive role in helping make this crop incredibly profitable for plantation owners in the South. And it helped the, the expansion of the triangle trade, which had been going on for centuries with previously for uh, raw materials like tobacco and rice and indigo, but now with cotton, it grew to a new scale. So enslaved Africans were brought over to the Caribbean and to the American South. From the American South, cotton would be shipped up to England where it would be manufactured in textile factories and shipped to other parts of the world. This is known as the triangle trade and it was the engine of the southern economy. And on the right you see bales of cotton on the docks of one of the wharfs in, in uh, Charleston. But this is a scene that played out in many southern ports as cotton was the engine of the southern economy. And it, it's from cotton that wealth was amassed in order to build the kind of buildings we're gonna be looking at in today's talk. So the, the other thing that's important to think about here is the impact that it's not just the economics, but also the bringing in of technology and stylistic ideals that would be embraced by these Southern um, patrons who would hire architects who themselves may have been from the North. So I wanna step back for a second though and look at two larger forces that are shaping architecture in the late 18th century that account also, if I may go back for a second, account for the stylistic diversity we can see 
classicism, yes, but in Savannah, the Owens Thomas House is a great example of what's usually called Regency architecture. In the middle is a glimpse of one of those special surprises, a Moorish revival building in Charleston, and on the right, a Gothic villa from the Garden District of New Orleans. So in the 18th century, English architects, more energetically than anybody else, embarked on a kind of scientific study of architecture of the world, especially the Roman world. And they would travel to all areas around the Mediterranean. Robert Wood, one of the first, traveled in the late 1840s to what's present day Jordan in the Eastern Mediterranean and studied the ruins of Bal studied Baalbek and Palmyra, two ancient Roman cities. And on the left, I'm showing a plate from his ruins of Baalbek. We'll see that same building in one of the English gardens in a few minutes. In the middle is Robert Adam, the leading neoclassical architect of 18th century England in the second half of the 18th century. In his early career, to earn your spurs as an architect, you had to demonstrate you knew Roman architecture and what better way to do it than to publish a book. So he traveled to the area of the uh, modern day Spalato near in Croatia. Um, what was, is, was known as, it is known as Split. And there he found the ruins of the Emperor Paulus of Di the Emperor of Diocletian, ruins of the Paulus of Diocletian, sorry. And as architects explored more and more of the Roman Empire, other architects, namely Stuart and Rebet, James Stuart and his partner Rebet, embarked on a journey to Athens to study Greek architecture. So they were trying to understand history through science, a very archeological, rational approach to the past. And this had a direct impact on neoclassicism. Robert Adam, who went to the Adriatic and studied Diocletian's palace and published it, took that knowledge and used it to bolster his career, which was phenomenally successful, working for wealthy, um, aristocrats renovating their palatial country houses. And this was English neoclassicism. On the outside, in this case, Kettleston Hall is a Palladian house designed years earlier. And typical Palladianism, it has a central mass with uh, dependencies or these wings attached by lower elements. And it sprawls across the, the site. And it's symmetrical, it's classical, but on the inside, Adam wanted you to feel like you had traveled to ancient Rome with the rotunda or saloon, which is a round building you see on a round room you see on the left, modeled after the Pantheon, and on the right, the great hall with its colonnade uh, lining the exterior of the outer part of the room. And even more dramatic was the transformation of a 16th century former abbey that had become a country house in the late 16th century, and you can see its medieval um, overtones from essentially the Elizabethan era. And on the outside, it looks Elizabethan. On the inside, Robert Adam transformed it into this amazing neoclassical masterpiece, room by room, that you go through the house, everyone different, but all of them evoking ancient Rome. So this was the mainstream of architecture, based on scientific knowledge, and to demonstrate the, the education and cultural sophistication of the building owners. And this idea spread to America. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he was in France as America's ambassador during the 1780s, had an opportunity to visit the Maison Carré in Nîmes. He met the French archeologist, Clarisseau, who was studying it. And there's a picture on the lower left of Clarisseau's study of what that building looked like at the time. And that directly inspired Jefferson's design with Clarissot's assistance for the Virginia State Capitol building of 1785 that was designed in France. And then the design was shipped to Virginia where the building that you see in the lower right was constructed. The wings on the outer edges were added years later. So just visualize the middle part, the first neoclassical building in America. The, another great Roman building, the Pantheon, inspired uh, neoclassical buildings in America as well, the Capitol Building in Washington, the University of Virginia, also by Jefferson. So this was the mainstream of architecture. This is what was going on in England, France, 
and America as what you might call mainstream architecture. But what about those oddball things I was showing you at the beginning, the Moorish and Gothic and other kinds of buildings? Where do they come from? Well, they grew out of a separate 18th century movement of Romanticism. And Romanticism is often associated with the early 19th century with uh, Romantic painters, poets, musicians, but Romanticism has a broader connotation of um, embracing the emotional side of things as opposed to the rational, intellectual, and cerebral. And so Romanticism as, an, as a love of, of danger, of the exotic, of feelings, of the sublime. And so Romanticism inspired the owners of those country houses in England to transform their gardens from formerly rational parterre gardens into these exotic landscapes like the one you see here, which is Stourhead. One of the most celebrated English gardens in, Amer in Britain, designed in the mid 18th century by Henry Flitcroft, an architect who worked for the cl his client, the building owner was Henry Hoare, and Hoare and Flitcroft had this idea to transform the garden into essentially a theme park. And if you are thinking right now Epcot or some other kind of theme park, you're actually on the right track. The English gardens are the ancestors of modern theme parks with the idea that you go into the garden and it transports you. And the inspiration for this were paintings like the one you see on the right. In fact, the painting on the right is the direct inspiration for the garden at Stourhead. It's a 17th century painting by a French Baroque art artist named Claude Lorraine the landscape with Aeneas at Delos, which is a scene from Virgil's Aeneid. So Stourhead was designed to be a realization of the journey of Aeneas across the Mediterranean in the Aeneid. So when you read the book, you can read the book and sit on a chair and pretend you're Aeneas, or you could go to this garden, get on a boat and paddle around the Mediterranean and visit these exotic places and like the pavilion on the right, the one from Baalbek I mentioned is at Stourhead. So as you go around the garden, you would see folly, what are called follies, these building sized garden pavilions that would transport you to another time and another place and fuel your imagination. And over time, other building, other uh, landscape, other uh, English aristocrats with their gardens got really, really creative in what would be a folly. For example, at the garden at Hagley Park, the architect Sanderson Miller was commissioned to design a ruin. So that is what we call a sham ruin. It was never an actual building. It was built brand new to look like an old ruin so that when you went to the site, it would take you back to the English past, to the English Middle Ages and the uh, time of the Knights of the Round Table or whatever associations you have with, with medieval castles. One of the most extraordinary gardens was that of the king at Kew Gardens, the royal gardens at Kew, where the architect William Chambers, a contemporary of Robert Adam, a neoclassical architect, was, was commissioned to design exotic pavilions. And this painting documents uh, on the far left, the Moorish pavilion, you can barely just see it, looking a bit like the Alhambra, in the middle, well, just off to the middle, uh, the Chinese pagoda, and in the distance to the far right, Turkish uh, pavilion, each of these, so as you wandered through Kew Gardens, you could go from Moorish Spain, China, and Turkey. And amazingly, the Chinese pagoda is still standing and it is not small. You can see some people over there on the left uh, at the ground floor. It's about a hundred and, not sure the total height, but over a hundred feet tall. And originally had little dragons on each level, as you see in the print in the middle. So it survives as a to remind us of just how important these follies were to the English in the 18th century. Simultaneously, the follies were inspiring a few, a relatively few building owners to embrace styles like Gothic onto their houses. And one of the first was the house called Strawberry Hill that you can see here in the, as it probably appeared in the 19th and through most of the 20th century. It has been since restored and it's bright white. 
but I decided to show it to you how it probably appeared in the 19th century. And this um, house, which grew over time, was the home of Horace Walpole, an English writer of Gothic novels, an another new escapist genre. So you had gardens that you could use as escapism or novels, a new literary genre as escapism. So those two forms of escapism fueled interest in architecture from faraway places. So as we get into, that's the background. So scientific exploration of the ancient past leading to neoclassicism, and then the, ex the love of the romantic, exotic, emotional. When you get to the early 19th century and the Regency period, those two forces find a happy combination in the work of Sir John Soane, the leading architect of the day in England, and as a representative of his work, the Bank of England, which was an ongoing project built by multiple architects, but he contributed a large part of the complex as well as this outer wall that you see here. But in the lower part of the screen, you can see two of his rooms, the one on the left, the bank stock office from the 1790s shows his moody illustrations, but also his simplification of architecture as far removed from the kind of interiors that Robert Adam was doing. And by the time you get to 1818, truly in the Regency period, the interior here of the old colonial office is so abstract. Gone are columns and beams, just these simple arched lines, these inscribed lines, and the halls divided up into these cubes of space with vaulting above them and skylights. As I mentioned earlier with the Dulwich Art Gallery, he was a master of manipulating skylights and having these dramatic lighting effects. Sadly, his interiors were destroyed around 1900 when they weren't appreciated at the time by the British, uh, the authorities at the Bank of England, but we do have lots of great illustrations of his rooms. I showed you this earlier, the Dulwich Art Gallery, and we can see that simplification. This is a later work by Sohn around the time of the, the second of those bank offices. And you can see the simplicity of the exterior here, where instead of columns, we have simple brick piers. We have arched, what we call blind arches that frame these round headed windows and the skylights and the entranceway actually is a very original composition. He wasn't tied to designing things exactly as it was done in the ancient past, the way Robert Adam did it, or other neoclassical architects like Thomas Jefferson. Rather, he was boldly experimenting with new forms. One of my favorite buildings by him, although you have to admit it is a, it's a garage. So of course it's not gonna be as elaborate as other buildings, but here he could have just made this a basic box of a building, but he didn't. These are the stables to a Royal Hospital complex. And he has an arched entrance for the carriages and the horses and the people entrances of the doors to the right and left, but he frames them with these concentric series of blind arches that when you look at it straight on as in the drawing, it actually creates the same kind of perspectival effect of space that his banking offices did and yet he's doing it in roughly about one foot, maybe a little over a foot of depth of the wall. Remarkably ingenious. In fact, modern architects love his works because they are, he does so much with so little. They're so abstract and yet so creative. So he's the architect who more than any other will inspire the architects who will practice in the American South. I mentioned the um, the use of cast iron. So this church of St. Michael's at Agberth near Liverpool in the, is another example of the Regency period and the experimentation with new materials, even in the context of a Gothic church. And so it's a new style. It was just coming back into use. Architects were beginning to feel a little more confident. Thanks to the pavilions, the Gothic follies built in the 18th century, architects could begin to use this style for church architecture in the early 19th century. But what's amazing is unlike Pugin in the next generation who would insist on building churches the way they were built in the Middle Ages, 
these architects were saying, well, hey, we've got this new technology. Let's blend Gothic architecture with new cast iron technology. So they were, it was an open-minded, highly experimental period. And nowhere do all of these forces come together more brilliantly than John Nash's uh, Royal Pavilion renovation that I mentioned earlier, this Moorish revival or Indian revival, sorry, Indian revival, uh, building with onion domes and minarets and uh, screens evocative of architecture in India. Of course, there's nothing quite like it in India. It is Nash's interpretation of Indian architecture. It's meant to be rather like the movie theaters in America of the early 20th century, an, an escapist fantasy. And so the Prince Regent would go here. Apparently he loved to party and the interiors are just as exotic as the exterior. There are Chinese rooms, this one has palm trees, and the, the structure on the inside, as well as that do central dome and the minarets are all made out of cast iron. So like the church, using new materials in new ways to create exotic architectural effects. So this takes us to the moment of the turn of the 19th century, the, roughly the era we call the Regency. And it's early in the history of the United States as a young nation. The Napoleonic Wars are raging in Europe. And if you have the choice between unemployment in Britain or Ireland or France, or maybe an opportunity in this new country called the United States, a few architects decide to take that opportunity. The first of whom was Benjamin Latrobe, whom you see on the far left. And we'll look at a few of his works. He was by far the most prolific of all of these architects, but we're only gonna look at a, a few of his, but he would work on the US Capitol, um, the Philadelphia Waterworks, banks, the uh, Virginia State Penitentiary. So he was very, very successful. James Holbin is mostly known for his work on the, for designing the, what's now called the White House. And uh, in fact, I've got some representative works by these architects. Uh, the two Frenchmen that you see down at the bottom, Maximilien, Maximilien Godefroy and Joseph Jacques Ramé, uh, they, uh, Godefroy was mainly based in Baltimore and Ramé up in Schenectady, New York. All of these architects were working mainly in a neoclassical vein for the most part. But Latrobe being probably the, of the four, the first four to arrive, he, as I said, had a very, very successful career, but he also was most willing to break free of that into this Sonian style, this John Sohn-like neoclassicism, late phase of neoclassicism, what we could probably call Regency classicism. And we can see it in a pair of banks that he designed uh, 20 years apart, one in Philadelphia, uh, the Bank of Pennsylvania seen on the left, with Chad Portico at each end and a domed banking hall in the middle. And on the right, the Louisiana State Bank in New Orleans, which happily still stands. Sadly, the one on the left was torn down in the mid 20th century. Now, in case you're looking at the one on the right, as I was doing over the past few days, and I have to thank David uh, Grissett for bringing this building to my attention as he invited me, he said, oh, he was so eager to show me pictures of buildings. And, and thank you, David, for bringing this, I had no idea Latrobe ended up in, and ended up dying in New Orleans. So Latrobe went down to New Orleans to work on a waterworks project, very similar to what he had done in Philadelphia. And while he was there, he was commissioned to design the Louisiana State Bank in 1819. But I was looking at it and going, wow, that's really odd. And specifically those, um, those, ball-like elements the, on the roof, as well as the dormers. You know, if you look at enough buildings by an architect long enough, you get a feeling it's like, that just doesn't look right. And then I was so gratified to discover this morning this, this um, 1822 engraving of the original exterior from, from, uh, from a document that's at the historic New Orleans collection, and someone happily had posted it online. And it shows that those elements on the roof were not original, so it had that simple profile. But Latrobe modulated his, his Regency classical architecture 
with the balconies and the French doors on the second floor, his concession to a kind of local idiom of how to make the building fit within its New Orleans context. In plan, both the bank in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, and the bank in New Orleans have very similar it's variations on the Pantheon. But unlike Robert Adam, who was really trying harder to make it look like uh, the Pantheon, is, and the other neoclassical buildings, here we see it's very stripped down and simplified and combined with all sorts of other shapes, which is typical as we'll see with William Jay's work in Savannah, the exploration of different geometrically shaped rooms, as you see, especially on the right, but also on the left, is a legacy of neoclassicism that Latrobe embraced. So I've rotated the Louisiana State Bank plan so that it's oriented to face the interior. When you look at the interior of this bank, you realize, wow, this architect is abstract. And this is Latrobe at his most abstract best. And happily, this building survives. It's an event space called, appropriately, Latrobe's. So if you're ever in New Orleans, go check it out. I can't wait to do so the next time I go to New Orleans. And this, it's, a dome, it's hard to tell, but that's a dome there on the left that has these large uh, cutouts that you can see on the plan. So we're, this is what the view you get from the entrance looking straight through to the uh, space in beyond. And the simplicity of this rivals Soane's most abstract work. So the people who call this neoclassicism to me are missing the point. Neoclassicism was connecting to ancient Rome and making those almost like quoting Shakespeare. You would quote different Roman buildings in neoclassicism. This is not doing that. This is going beyond class, the neoclassicism to the creative classicism of the Regency period. Another architect who would do this and do it with great panache in the South is William Jay, a young architect who's who made his way to, of all places, Savannah. Now granted, Savannah was the 15th largest city. New Orleans was much larger and pro more prosperous, but Savannah was a, a growing city. It was quickly becoming a prosperous place with lots of planter wealth and shipping wealth coming into the, into the city. On the right is a painting of the city a little bit later from 1837, seen from roughly the waterfront area, looking down Bull Street. So this, is more or less what Savannah looked like when William J. arrived. The architecture of most, most of the houses that were standing when William J. arrived, now bear in mind, Savannah is a younger city than New Orleans and Charleston. It was established in 1733. It had a very slow, sluggish start during the 18th century. And it also suffered some pretty tragic fires, including 1796. Uh, so a lot of the early buildings were already gone. Uh, but some survive, and these are some of the oldest cottages that were typical of the kind of buildings that Jay would have seen. The grandest buildings Jay would have seen are the two on the left, and either Palladian, in fact, that's probably the grandest 18th century house that survived in Savannah. It's a masonry Palladian style house, the James Habersham house, otherwise known today as the Pink House, good place. It's, it's now a restaurant, so I commend it to you. And the Paul Hamilton Wilkins house, slightly later, is a great example of a wood frame of a, sorry, of a wood frame uh, five bay center hall house. And slightly later, also federal style, but now a more elaborate in brick, are, is a house that was going up as Jay was arriving in Savannah. So Savannah was architecturally very traditional and conservative. And William J. would change that with a series of buildings around the town. And so we have houses, a theater, a bank, and a hotel that he designed in downtown Savannah, in the city of Savannah. His houses are his most celebrated contribution to the built landscape of Savannah, with the Owens Thomas House on the top left, originally known as the Richard Richardson House, the Telfair House in the top right, which is now the Telfair Academy of Arts and Sciences, or otherwise known as the Telfair Art Museum, the Bullock House, which sadly was torn down around 1910 uh, for a civic center project, and the 
uh, William Scarborough House in the lower right, which is now the Ships of Sea Museum. William J, and I'll be looking at a couple of these houses in more detail. Uh, William J's background though, before we jump into Savannah and his works in Savannah, it's good to know a little bit about his background because he was, he was a rather extraordinary architect. You could argue is in some ways the most quintessentially Regency architect or architect to practice in America. Uh, he came from Bath, which was uh, a hotbed of Palladian and neoclassical architecture. It was a fashionable spa town where wealthy Londoners and wealthy people from other parts of England would have a house and take the waters as it were. The, it's like hot springs and warm springs, um, destination towns in America. He trained in London under an architect named Roper and, uh, at, and it was during the Regency period years. So he was in London when John Nash was building, planning out and building Regent Street, Regent Park, the various terraces like parked Crescent here that you see in the middle. And down below you see one of, Jay was able to design one building, uh, a chapel for a dissenter congregation. And the Albion Chapel was his one London work. And it reflects the influence of John Soane. But he, his sister had married a Savannian and that opened the door to getting commissions in the new world. In, and Savannah had a booming economy so he followed the money, as it were, and uh, received a wealth of commissions in Savannah, much like Latrobe did 20 years earlier in cities in the Northeast. The Richard Richardson House is, in many respects, his most celebrated. And it, like the Brighton Pavilion, is a great embodiment of, is a great embodiment of Regency style, but also technology and innovation. So the building, just to get you oriented, takes advantage of a peculiar feature of Savannah's urban plan. And we'll see this with another house in a little bit. Savannah's plan is celebrated for having, by this point, probably about 15 squares. It ultimately had 24 squares. And the, each of the squares has these public building lots, which were originally intended to be public building lots. You can see four of them here in the middle of the screen facing, each facing the two squares to the right and the left. And these, what are called trust lots, are, are usually have a mansion or a public building on the front end of the lot. And the one in yellow is the trust lot for the Owens Thomas, or rather Richard Richardson House. And here you can see the young architect, he was only in his 20s, his first American commission, the Richard Richardson House, and it is immediately so distinct from the more traditional Palladian and federal style buildings that populated the streets of Savannah. It has a portico, but not just a standard issue portico, but this undulating, curvaceous, yet lithe and elegantly elongated uh, portico with these outrageously skinny columns, this bowing uh, porch, almost as if it's pregnant, and then these curving arms that reach out and, and embrace the, and greet you upon arrival. As you go through the gates, you get your choice of right or left. You go up onto this porch. And then there's this concave embrace on the porch itself into which you go through, the, through those doors into the house proper. The building also has an amalgam of a few older features. So this was like an essay, almost like a portfolio piece where, where Jay was showing off virtually every architectural feature you could imagine, blind arches, pilasters, coining the blocks at the corner there, uh, different kinds of cornices, a pediment, a uh, fan light window. So it is, it is a rather busy facade. But in plan, it reflects these traditions like Latrobe was embracing of the geometry of neoclassicism and so he's got square rooms and spaces shown in blue. He's got round spaces, the entrance portico, as well as the half of the dining room and the octagons or a half octagon there at the back. So he used geometry much like Robert Adam and Latrobe had done, even though the overall composition is a center hall plan, very conventional. So upon entry, you are greeted by this 
this spacious entry hall and a pair of columns that mark the the public realm, as it were, as a visitor, and then private realm with the stairs beyond. But when you look through that screen of columns to the staircase, which rises up and then doubles back, a bifurcating staircase, we can see a, a rather odd feature. So the lavishness of this interior is typical of Regency architecture. It's a legacy of neoclassicism. But that feature up above, it's kind of hard to understand what is that? until you go upstairs and you discover it's a bridge. It's unique in America. And it was the way that Jay solved the problem of a house where normally the hallway would run through the middle of the house, except because he has two flights coming up, the center of the hall had to bridge over the middle of the staircase. So he literally made it a bridge, structurally it arches to make it sounder. And it makes a very dramatic effect, a novel, an innovative solution to spatial planning in, in this early work by Jay. He was also sensitive to the importance of making these spaces useful. So all the gilding on the railing was, would pick up candlelight at night and help navigate you through the hall. Downstairs in the dining room, we can see some of the, that rounded shape I was showing you, but also on the left, really remarkable for America at this time, in fact, remarkable anywhere, frankly, is this skylight on the north side of the Owens Thomas house. And by being on the north side, it will always have ambient light coming through. So it's got this amber glass that gives a tremendous glow to the dining room throughout the day. And it was directly influenced by the skylight designs of John Soane back in London. So it shows this Regency creativity with lighting and spatial effects that Sohn had made it the focus of his career and here the young architect is exploring it too. On the face of that um, skylight we see a Greek key or a Greek meander motif which is typical of the era and it reflects how the the Regency drew in Roman, Greek, and just purely inventive features. But Jay didn't stop there, and his client, Richardson, was extremely wealthy as a shipping merchant and could afford to import new, really newfangled materials from England, two of which appear on the exterior. The railing on the front is called code stone. It's a molded cement-like um, stone that was prefabricated and could be shipped and was used widely in Regency and earlier periods in England. And on the right, cast iron, a structural cast iron porch attached to the side of the building with these elongated classical acanthus leaf supports. This is one of the earliest uses of cast iron in America. And it reflected this new embrace of this technology back in England. But perhaps the most innovative aspect of the Owens Thomas House is the plumbing. The building is one of the first in America that used rainwater that was collected by that odd roof shape, it was shaped like a funnel to collect rainwater into the, into the roof and it drains down and um, the rainwater goes into a series of cisterns that feed, is gravity fed uh, plumbing system that ultimately ends up in the basement where there are bathtubs and even a shower where that woman is standing is beside a walk-in shower from 1818. And then the drain is that trough in the floor. The interesting thing is this is long before there were sewers in Savannah. So they must have had some kind of um, place for the water to drain, um, some kind of septic yard out in the back. But uh, a recent book by John Dunn and Sarah, Un and Sarah Underwood about William J has revealed that the has revealed that the inspiration for this may have been from the client himself. Richard Richardson was from Bermuda. And in Bermuda, collecting rainwater was very important. And so that was a great connection that they brought to light and explains why this building, unique among Jay's buildings, honestly, in using this technology, a real pioneering example of the spirit of the day, really, that there was an openness of trying all sorts of things. Jay would go on to design a number of different mansions, as I've mentioned, but 
One other I wanted to just draw attention to is the Bullock House, sadly lost, and especially sad because it had one of the most extraordinary staircases I've ever seen in American architecture, anywhere, frankly. Six monumental, to, monumental uh, Corinthian columns, inside which the staircase corkscrewed up to the second floor and provided this dramatic centerpiece to the entrance hall and its curvature mimicking the curvature of the porch outside. It, it just illustrates the adventurous nature of Jay's approach to design and of the spirit of Regency architecture. He went on to design public build, at least one public building, a bank, very similar to the Bank of England in its simplicity. Um, the second bank of the United States that stood right behind the pink house and differed so dramatically from earlier neoclassical or contemporaneous Greek revival banks elsewhere in the country. Jay concluded his North American career in Charleston where he designed uh, this building, the William Mason Smith House, and adapted the Charleston single house, a very typical house form in Charleston, but adapted to the Regency classical style of blind arches and abstract form that we've seen already. So the early 19th century, as we get beyond the Regency and get into the 1830s and 1840s, architects start ex looking to history like a well or a well into which you could drop your bucket and pull out inspiration. Or to use another metaphor, as depicted by the American artist Thomas Cole, the architectural past was like a dreamscape. And the architect's dream depicts all these different eras in history and the options, be it the classical tradition bathing in the light on the right or the more romantic tradition on the left with this Gothic building. And it's interesting to think of the possibilities. And it's also interesting to see that um, some of the most exotic stylistic expressions of the era are in the South. So for example, in Richmond, is one of the countries, probably the best example of the Egyptian revival for a building in America is the Virginia Medical College of 1838 designed by Thomas Stewart. And as you can see, it still stands and you can go visit it. It's quite an extraordinary building. And even the fence around the site has these mummy-like uh, fence posts. And if you get close enough, I didn't have a detail, but if you get close enough, the base of those posts have little toes sticking out and they, they're like bandaged mummies. And as you enter, you can see the ornament on the inside is evocative of what they knew of Egyptian architecture at the time. I often wonder what would a, me a new medical student have thought he was getting into upon entering this building as back in the 1830s and 40s. But the cho choice of Egyptian may have been because the Egyptians were the first ancient culture to practice the kind of medicine that with surgery and other, um, the mummification may have been the association there. In Charleston, a few years later, we see one of the most exotic examples of bank architecture in America, uh, a building that stood beside a much more conventional bank, a classical bank, as you see in the drawing. This is a wonderful example of the Moorish revival designed by local architect Francis uh, D. Lee, the Farmers and Exchange Bank. And this catered to plantation owners and people with wealth. And now why this Moorish or what Lee himself called the Saracenic revival? I can only guess, honestly, but some people have speculated that the choice of the style, which carries on ex in an extraordinary way to the interior, as you see on the right, might have been the publication in 1851, so two years earlier, of Washington Irvin's The Alhambra and specifically the illustrations such as some of those you see on the left. Others had previously thought it was the Regency Indian Revival but this seems more compelling because of the timeliness of it that this idea of the exotic uh, was incredibly appealing and it's Irving's The Alhambra is in the tradition of Walpole's Gothic novels those exotic um, transportation to another place. When we think of the Gothic, and as we conclude, as I conclude my presentation talking about the Gothic revival, when we think of Gothic revival, we mostly think of churches, 
And in fact, there are a lot of them in America, Gothic Revival churches directly influenced by Pugin and his call for more accurate church design. One of the first churches and one of the first architects to really respond to Pugin's call was the New York architect Richard Upjohn and his famous Trinity Church on Wall Street and Broadway. Although it's sort of transitional, has some features Pugin wouldn't have approved of, but it looks more or less like the churches he was designing in that print on the left. But there was a separate Gothic Revival tradition that grew out of the gardens, and that was the, the Gothic Revival of houses, such as Strawberry Hill, as I've already mentioned. And the use of Gothic for non-religious buildings was given an enormous jolt of interest from the burning of the British Houses of Parliament in 1834 and the competition for a new Houses of Parliament which the national government dictated had to be in either a Gothic or Elizabethan style for nationalistic reasons. And the winner was Charles Berry and our friend A.W.N. Pugin. Well, that project was just barely getting off the ground. The competition was in 1836. Construction didn't begin until 1840. So the completed Houses of Parliament that you saw in the advertisement uh, for this talk wasn't available to people as an inspiration until much later, but the competition definitely was putting the movement on the map. And so the goth, interest in Gothic was growing and was mostly for houses, as I mentioned. And one of the first great Gothic houses, and especially for villa houses, houses out in the country. And Lyndhurst, Lyndhurst outside of New York, up the Hudson River at Terrytown, was designed for the mayor of New York, William Paulding. And it was designed, as you see in that little inset, half the size of its current form. And then a later owner commissioned the same architect to expand it and basically double it in size. But this is one of the great celebrated uh, Gothic Revival houses in America, one of the earliest in 1838. Well, a few years later, uh, Davis collaborated with the leading landscape architect of the day, Andrew Jackson Downing, and the two of them published a book called Cottage Residences, and in, published in 1842. And among the designs they published was this one that you can see for a Gothic cottage. And this probably more than anything else popularized the Gothic form. And one of the places we see it resonate is in New Orleans, where about half a dozen houses like those published by uh, Downing and Davis were built most notably, and the first being the Briggs Staub House in 1849. Interestingly, and you can see on the left that is a Gothic house, it has a porch very similar to the porch you see in the cottage residences. And that central gable is similar and the window is very Gothic in form. It's a cross gabled design that basically a center hall house similar to classical houses like we saw in Savannah, but now all dressed up in a Gothic costume. The person who commissioned it, interestingly, was British. And a London board, as you can see on the plaque, Charles Briggs was a, a London board insurance agent. And Gothic wasn't widely accepted in New Orleans, but nonetheless, it had great appeal to him. It was a villa. On the right, you can see the French Quarter. This building stood way over there in the Garden District where a lot of the buildings are essentially like suburban villas. And where that red marker is at 2605 Britannia Street, that's the address of the Briggs Staub House. The architect of that house was James Gallier, I forgot to mention, who went on to design another building in a Gothic fashion, of all things a warehouse, the Leeds Davis House. So Leeds Davis building in New Orleans in the warehouse district. So the Gothic was being used for a variety of secular non-religious buildings in these cities. And perhaps the most extravagant and sumptuous Gothic revival house in the country is in Savannah. And it's the Charles Green House another British immigrant who came to America, settled in Savannah, as the story goes, rather like Carnegie, was penniless, became successful, and as a cotton merchant and ship owner, and built what is purported to be one of the most expensive houses in America at the time. It cost 93,000, 
And in 1853, I'm not sure how many, I trust that would be many, many, many millions of dollars today. The house, as you can see, fronted, uh, it's a tr another trust lot mansion. It occupies a site, it's a villa, essentially. Trust lot mansions in Savannah, they occupy those trust lot sites, are freestanding islands and they face a green square. This one also happens to have a Gothic church right next door, but it's an urban villa. So the Gothic style, even though it's in the center of downtown Savannah, the Gothic style is appropriate. It's even more of a Gothic villa feel because today you can make out that where Macon Street used to go between the two buildings, as we saw in the black and white photo, has disappeared. And there's a garden there today. The city sold that little piece of the street to the congregation of the church that bought the Gothic house as their uh, as their manse. But the house is an extraordinary one. It has cast iron all over the exterior, designed by New York architect John Norris. So again, that theme that we've seen before of innovative exploration of a style, bringing in new materials. So all, anything painted black on the exterior is cast iron. The windows, the entrance portico, the porch on the left. And on the inside, you get this this extravagant Gothic ornament all over, an extra wide center hall. And um, the if you get a chance to visit Savannah, it's open to public tours. It's in really, really an extraordinary uh, kind, of, uh, kind of place that takes you into the realm of the imagination. And that was part of the escapism, the legacy of that kind of escapism was still strong in these years. Well, I want to conclude at this house, because it was at the Green House, the House of Charles Green, where Sherman, General Sherman, during the American Civil War, ended his march to the sea, decisively breaking in half the Confederacy and presenting the city of Savannah to President Lincoln on Christmas Eve, 1864, as a Christmas present. It's from this house, it, this house became Sherman's headquarters while he occupied Savannah for a couple months. And it's from this house that Special Field Orders 15, basically enacting the goal of, of Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, putting it into practice, guaranteeing 40 acres for every freed slave. Uh, the basis for the idea of the 40 acres and a mule tradition started at the greenhouse. And I stop here because the wealth of the cotton economy that made all of this possible came to a dramatic end. And the idea of enslavement and the cotton economy obviously would forever change, the Civil War forever changed the Southern economy and brought an end to the, the focus of what I've been addressing today. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. So Robin, uh, questions have been posed in the uh, Q&A section. The first one is, uh, did General Lafayette speak from the side porch of the Owens Thomas House on his tour post-revolution? Yes, so that cast iron porch I showed on the side of the Owens Thomas House or the Richard Richardson House was the place from which uh, the Marquis de Lafayette uh, presented two speeches to the people of Savannah during his tour of the, of the United States in 1825 on the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the revolution. And he delivered two speeches, one in English, one in French, to the people of Savannah. And so that porch is sometimes nicknamed the Lafayette Balcony. All right, uh, the next one is, can you clarify why early architecture within the US was mostly federal or Greek style? Was it also due to an idealistic view of grandeur associated with those two styles? Yeah, so the federal style is essentially the Georgian architectural tradition rebranded in an American way. And Georgian architecture had been the bread and butter architecture of builders and, and carpenters and architects through most of the 18th century in England and as they came to America, it was a very economical and simple way to build. It was orderly and uh, you can see Georgian architecture all through uh, the East Coast cities, especially in the Northeast. And after the revolution, it was renamed federal to make it more American. And so, uh, so that style uh, 
in its most extravagant, you could say it borders on neoclassicism. And uh, the, was the other part of it, um, was the other part of it why the Greek revival? Uh, yes, uh, and was it due, also due to an idealistic view of grandeur associated with those two styles? Yeah, so especially the Greek revival tied into American ideal, geopolitical ideals of, or philosophical ideals of the basis for the country in, um, as a democracy. And they were very proud of the concept of democracy. And so ancient Greece having invented that, the, there was this um, political affinity to uh, the Greek revival. Whereas in Europe, the Greek revival represented cultural superiority. And interestingly, in the American South, Greek revival was also wildly popular, but it, the association in the South was because even though it was democracy, but in ancient Athens where democracy began, the Athenians owned slaves. So for the Southerners, Greek, the Greek revival was especially relevant because it was sort of doubly American from a Southern point of view. It was democratic, but also the ancient Athenians in a sense legitimize the institution of slavery. So Greek revival was the go-to style for the grandest of public buildings in the early 19th century. Uh, next question is, what is it that inspired you to study and focus on architectural history? Ah, I love the autobiographical questions. You know, it's funny, I teach a, a class um, for non-majors called Architectural History in Savannah, and the first thing I do is I give them an assignment for them to write their architectural autobiography. In other words, what impacted where they grew up, the buildings they've lived in, to get them to reflect about how architecture has been a part of their life. And so in doing that, I created one for myself and it really made me reflect on that very question. And I had the good fortune to grow up in a house in Toronto that was made out of architectural salvage from an old train station. And there were fragments of the old train station here and there that were not your normal building, house building details. And there was a vault in the basement and the walls were 18 inches thick of sandstone. And it was reassembled to be a hotel, but it was built in 1929 and the crash prevented it from ever being a hotel. And so that was my home I grew up in. And supplement to that, um, my parents traveled a lot. And whenever we traveled, we would visit ruins in Ireland and England and castles and cathedrals. My parents, both having studied art history, loved old buildings. So I think the die was cast pretty early on for me. And my parents, I believe, are watching, and thank you so much for doing that. Great. Um, can you tell us about the gas-fired cupola air circulation in the Green Medlin House? Yeah, so uh, the last building I shown, the Green House, otherwise known as the Green Meldrum House, has John Norris installed a, a kind of tech, I, want, I yeah, it's a great thing to mention, and I probably should have mentioned as an example of technology. At the top of the staircase uh, that branches off that center hall, the staircase is not in the middle, but it's off to the side, it spirals up. And at the top of the staircase is a glass dome. And around the base of the glass dome is a series of gas jets. And the top of the glass can be opened and the, uh, they turn on the gas jets and it uses confection current. So it, it could be a stiflingly hot day in Savannah but if you can create some air movement, so you open the, the windows at the top of the dome, light the gas jets, so gas service in the 1850s was a relatively new technology, and pirate, you, know, you heat up the dome, and of course it needs air to go up the staircase, and you open the doors. It's not gonna cool the air per se, but it will certainly help with air circulation, and a breeze in Savannah or any other Southern city in the summer is something to cherish. So if you could open your, create a man-made breeze, basically, that's what he was doing. Next question is, what was the cost of building the Owens Thomas house then? You know, I should have looked that up. Um, it was expensive, for sure it was expensive. Um, I don't know the exact figure. If the Green Meldrum House, which is about 30 years later, was 93,000, uh, I would speculate 
and this is a speculation and they may know the answer to this, um, but uh, probably somewhere between 30 and 50,000, which let's see if um, I know by 1900, you have to multiply every thousand dollars becomes like $80,000. Uh, so in the 19th century, if we doubled that and said every thousand dollars becomes like two hundred thousand dollars you begin to understand how expensive these houses were that if it's fifteen thousand or twenty thousand times two hundred you begin to see these are many millions of dollars to build these houses next question is were the garden follies used primarily in public spaces or did they become popularized in private gardens as well uh, the Garden Follies were almost exclusively private gardens. So Stourhead, Hagley Park, uh, the two gardens I showed, as well as Kew Gardens were, well, Kew Gardens is kind of open to the public now, but Stourhead and uh, Hagley Park are um, private gardens and were meant for the enjoyment of the owner and guests and were a reflection of the owner's knowledge. So think of the garden, the Follies, as a kind of a living encyclopedia that if you had, so uh, for example, at Stourhead, there was that Temple of Baalbek. By having Flitcroft build a Temple of Baalbek um, on the grounds of Stourhead, it showed that Henry Hoare was on top of recent literature, archeological literature, and a, an a educated wealthy person of that era was expected to know how to read Greek and Latin. There are no, they were expected to have read the classics. They're expected to have a knowledge of architecture and sometimes were amateur architects like Thomas Jefferson and Horace Walpole. And so the idea that if you were wealthy that you would read archeological books about ancient Rome sounds really odd today, but that's how you proved you were, cult you were uh, culturally sophisticated. So the follies were, in some ways, a kind of reflection of the owner's knowledge, interests, and desire for escapism. And they were very, very private. Now, the follies would later pop up in some pri in public places, but they're almost exclusively um, private. And one of the, I call them theme parks because, in fact, they use that phrase in the 18th century of, that Stourhead was a theme park. And the, um, when today you go to Epcot, that is very much in that tradition. And, they, and it still has pavilions that are exotic and take you to faraway places. All right, next question. Have you seen the downtown Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee? Architect William Strickland. It is recognized as an excellent example of Egyptian revival. I have seen it. And, uh, and that's in Nashville. That's a great point. I'd forgotten about that. Um, Thank you for whoever mentioned that. Um, yeah, so that's further evidence of these exotic styles being embraced in the American South. And I'd never, before putting together this talk, I'd never really noticed that pattern before. It's not to say that any of these revivals didn't appear in other parts of the country, but it seems like they were more embraced or their most exuberant expressions are in Southern cities. And it might be because there was more money in the South, generally speaking. Um, some of the wealthiest cities, New Orleans and Charleston were fabulously wealthy cities, as well as Nashville, Chattanooga, Savannah, Mobile, and so on. Um, so the next question is, uh, the Crescent is such a lovely area. Why are there so few areas that use this beautiful way of architecture? The Crescent in London, I gather. Um, actually, the whole West End of London is has what we call terraced housing. I think the, per, the question is referencing what I showed from London. And at least in London, there are quite a few um, rows of terraced housing all through the West End of London. So it's, pretty, uh, it's funny, I was watching uh, recently a TV show called Belgravia. And for those of you, I forget what network it's on, but um, it's a six part kind of mini series based in the in an area that looks just like the, that crescent where all the houses are white and it's all very aristocratic and 
and it has the merchant class mixed in there and it's the dynamics between the aristocrats and the merchants who can afford to live in the same area and Belgravia was at the high end of that kind of West End development and, and Chelsea, Soho, these are um, different neighborhoods in, in that and all along Regent Street. Uh, so there are quite a few of them in London. Now, why uh, other cities didn't do it? Um, I mean, Savannah to an extent had some of that prosperity and some of the orderliness of row housing. Um, and Philadelphia and Baltimore have row housing, but the elegance, this, I think it was just the preference of the time. And I'm not sure why it wasn't more widely spread, the white plaster with the black trim. It, uh, is greatly appealing today. The funny thing about it and what um, it's kind of ironic that it's only recently that the, the, those blocks are to be fully appreciated because for decades and decades and decades, London, the main heating fuel in London from the probably the mid 19th century until the mid 20th it was coal. And so almost all the architecture in London was blackened by coal soot. So over the past couple of decades, those buildings have been reborn and they look fabulous, uh, brought back to their nice, clean, pristine Regency appearance. All right, the styles we cover today seem to have been closely associated with the great institutions or wealthy individuals of the day. How far did these styles trickle down to more modest forms or typologies of architecture? Well, and that was, that's a great question. And the, the book by, uh, David Downing and Davis, cottage residences, their goal was precisely that, was to allow designs that formerly could be afforded by the mayor of New York, like uh, Lyndhurst, could trickle down to at least middle class. But we're talking some of the cottages that are Gothic cottages that have been built in the second half of the 19th century, directly patterned after that book and others like it, um, would be you know, very accessible, affordable houses. And uh, as was mentioned when I was introduced, I'm from Toronto and there are very modest later um, echoes of that cent tall central gable with the um, side gabled roof to either side, incredibly modest. So I would say eventually it would trickle down all the way to working class worker cottages in different parts of North America. And um, that was the trajectory of that was absolutely in mind of Downing and Davis when they created cottage residences. While you're looking at architecture in the South, have you studied the remarkable architecture of Galveston, Texas? Sadly, no. Um, I'm aware of it. And, you know, that's the, the plight of being an architectural historian is that it's you know whenever we travel I'm like a kid in a candy shop that drives my family crazy that we can't drive down the road without me oogling something and or pulling off to look at be it a, a Regency thing or a, a, a diner or some crazy Thing on Route 66. So um, I've never been to Galveston. So um, I look forward to visiting. I've been to other Texas cities, but not Galveston. But I'm aware that it, it was another one of those fabulously, uh, like Natchez in um, Mississippi, you know, they're cities that had fabulous, fabulous wealth and created amazing buildings and certainly worth visiting. Is the biggest example of Egyptian revival in the South, the U.S. Custom House in New Orleans, a Galilee architect? That's possible. There are so few Egyptian revival buildings and um, I hadn't thought about that one. That's the same architect whose work I was showing in my presentation. Galilee was one of the leading architects in, in New Orleans of, the 18, of that period of the 1840s and 50s. Um, I think that would be a safe bet. And uh, again, there, most, most of the Egyptian revival work, and another big one was a building in New York City called the Tombs, nicknamed the Tombs, the Houses of Detention 
um, which was sort of a holding pen for people being prosecuted and tried. And it was in Manhattan and it was a substantial Egyptian revival building too. And it was torn down. Um, but mostly Egyptian revival shows up in cemeteries, cemetery gates, cemetery tombs. That's where the vast majority of Egyptian revival things are to be found because the Egyptian association with death uh, and their obsession with death. Uh, so there are relatively few examples. And I imagine the one in New Orleans, the custom house would be among the biggest. All right, the last one in the questions and answers section. Do you know the Egyptian revival church in Sag Harbor, New York, which I believe was designed by Latrobe? Wow. No, and that's one of the great things about this q and A. I'm learning. Uh, I don't know that. So um, that would be great to look at. So Sag Harbor uh, Egyptian Revival Church. I'll make a mental note of that. And I don't know it. Thank you for telling me about that. So uh, there's a couple of questions that made their way into the chat. I'm just going to, I see one. I'm sorry if there were any more that were put into the chat and not the Q&A section. But would you consider Philip Johnson's Glass House to be a more recent example of the Regency style? Wow, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. Um, you know, I, I purposely use the language of modernism when discussing the Regency. So I describe John Soane's designs as abstract. I don't call them minimalist per se, but that's a synonym for abstraction. And the same idea, what John Soane was doing in the early 19th century is very similar to what Philip Johnson and his German counterpart, Mies van der Rohe, who came to America in the late 1930s. And Johnson was an early admirer of the German class, well, German modernist, but Mies van der Rohe and later Philip Johnson um, would design modern buildings and modern buildings that sort of speak to a classical tradition through either a concern for symmetry or the articulation of, of what essentially are columns and beams abstracted and interpreted using a new material. So I guess given what I've said about Regency architecture and its embrace of, of aesthetic simplicity and its embrace, not so much by Sohn, but by uh, architects like Nash and uh, J of embracing new materials like cast iron. Uh, yeah, I'd never would have thought of connecting those two, but I guess you could say they belong to a a trend within classical within architectural design that at any given time you have architects who trend towards uh, greater simplicity and also this idea of distilling architecture down to its essence of an expression of its of its, um, what we call its tectonic forms, its, its structural expression, what we sometimes label as rationalism. So Philip Johnson, and uh, I guess another aspect of Johnson's design is that the glass house implies these wonderful spatial experiences that John Soane would have loved as well. So um, yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know if I'd literally put a label on it, Regency, but I think they both, both the modernism of the 1950s, especially of someone like Johnson or Mies van der Rohe, shares a lot in common with, um, with Sohn and William J. Uh, of 150 years earlier. So this will be the last message, uh, the last question, um, since we are running uh, kind of over our lot of time. Um, it is the cotton exchange in Savannah uses terracotta casting detailing and integrates brick. Do you think it is the last expression of the Regency style or more an example of mid 19th century Victorian architecture? Can you, I, I missed the, the building you referenced. It, uh, the cotton exchange in Savannah. Oh, okay. Uh, I would say that is uh, very much, um, well, some of these trends like the embrace of new technology will carry on into the Victorian era. And, and that's the, the thing that's so exciting about 19th century architecture is, you know, a lot of people just see it as old fashioned, but it, a lot of it is cutting edge. And the Cotton Exchange, for those who don't know, is a building built over a street on the waterfront in Savannah, sandwiched between warehouses. 
and it stands on cast iron columns and it's a unique building where the whole building is literally over a street and the but the outward expression is victorian queen anne style highly ornate um, so i would say it is quintessentially victorian but it builds on that regency tradition of embracing new technology Anyway, thank you very much, um, Professor Williams. Um, I'm Karen Karpwich, the Executive Director of the English Speaking Union. I want to thank you today for joining us and kicking well, off you. this amazing series. And it was an honor to have you. And thank you very much, Dave, for making the introduction and kicking this off. I want to invite everyone back on August the 5th to talk about the Bronte sisters. Uh, we'll also be sending out a questionnaire specifically on the event, if you would please fill it out. And it also makes recommendations, asks you for recommendations on possible speakers for extending these, this series. As we all know, this is going to be a format that we're all going to be experiencing for a very long time now. So we're going to extend this through, throughout the year. I want to make mention of the fact that these events have all, are all curated by the branches. So all of the speakers that you're going to experience in these happy hours have come from recommendations from the branches. And I want to thank everybody for bringing your local talent or your national talent to our attention and sharing it with the rest of your colleagues at the English Speaking Union. With that said, I want to thank the committee chaired by Karen Blair Brand for doing the work around this because I think they did an amazing job in terms of pulling this together and the quality of the presentation. Thank you again. And I also want to mention the fact too that we hope we all see you the week of October the 19th, which are international council meeting and our annual general meeting, which will be all presented on the Zoom platform with a special gala uh, and will be joined by Her Royal Highness Princess Anne for that event and events will be streamed to you and hopefully we will be streaming many of your events to all the rest of the country. So thank you again and we look forward to seeing you again to talk about the Bronte sisters on August the 5th. Thank you all. Thanks again, Robin. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Josh for making it happen. Great. That was fun. Good activity at the end with the question. Did it sound okay? It did. <laughs> no. Hey, um, do you need me for anything else? I think you're good to go in many Once again. Okay, I'm ready for that libation, let me tell you. There you go. Mix one of those up. Uh, I yeah. hope, your hope your dad has the recipe too. There you go. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll ask him, make sure that they're getting the Ch Chatham Artillery Punch going up at their senior residence in Toronto. So 91 yeah, year old, why not? The video recipe really works. So I recommend. Exactly. Sure. Okay. Take care. Take care. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Thanks, Josh.